So yes, folks, thank you again for joining us today uh, in the 49 North virtual meeting platform. We are very, very pleased and honored to have Integra Resources presenting today. Uh, great story. I've known these guys for a long time, uh, going back to the Integra Gold days. Um, and they are, you know, a development uh, gold silver company that is advancing the Delamar project in southwestern Idaho, as well as the Florida project and War Eagle as well. And today we have Josh Surface, uh, VP of Corporate Development, who will be presenting today and joining Josh is Chris Gordon, uh, their Director of Corporate Development. And very happy to have both you guys today. And so without further ado, the great Josh Surface and the great Chris Gordon. Take it away, guys. Thank you to the great Matt Berry for, for hosting us. Really appreciate it. And really looking forward to taking everyone through the presentation today. Once again, uh, as Matt said, my name is Josh Surface uh, and, and Chris, is, Chris is joining me here as well. Uh, so we're going to just run you through uh, an update on the, on the project or an introduction. Uh, if you have any questions, happy to answer them. Uh, I'll try to you know, stick to about a 25-minute presentation, so we have plenty of, plenty of time to ask any questions uh, at the end of it. Uh, I will be making forward-looking statements, uh, so that's why this is uh, appearing on your screen right now as we talk about you know, 2020, 2021, and, and the future here. So Integra for us, what's really interesting about it is, is we really believe it's the right gold story for any portfolio. And, and you know, when you're looking at the, the junior space, the developer space, there's really five things you really want to focus on. And there are things that we believe we have checked the box on. The first is we have a very strong balance sheet. You know, we're, we just completed a financing about six weeks ago. We raised U.S. $23 million. It brings our total uh, treasury to about U.S. $38 million. <clears throat> That will get us through Q4 next year with our pre-feasibility study. And it'll allow us also to have a strong expiration program uh, throughout the balance of 2021. Uh, the second thing is always a tier one jurisdiction. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work for com companies in Canada and the US where you know, that's something that's a given. Um, but certainly, not only is it uh, great to be working in the US, but to be working in Idaho, which was ranked by the Fraser Institute as eighth in the world for investment attractiveness for mining projects. Uh, in fact, the only other state ahead of us in the US is, is Nevada, which is our neighbor just to the south here in, in Idaho. And uh, just to, to orient yourself on where we are, if you look to the left side of that slide, uh, you can see Idaho <clears throat> here, you know, there's a variety of uh, mining projects, exploration projects, and development projects. You know, Idaho is pretty evenly split, kind of a third, a third, a third. You have your phosphate, cobalt patch in the east, your silver, uh, your silver valley up in the north. And then where we're located, which is just the southwest corner, really on the border of Oregon and Nevada. We really like this project because of the scarcity of assets out there right now. We believe that you know, you're, we're seeing for the first time uh, the, 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 fi the uh, financials from some of these major mining companies, and they are phenomenal right now because of uh, the strong gold price over the last few months. But ironically, over the last couple of years, they've focused a lot on margins, on slashing expiration budgets to, to bolster uh, to bolster their balance sheets, and they've done that without really replacing the pipeline. And so we don't believe there's a lot of projects out in tier one jurisdictions in particular um, that have what, what it takes uh, to break, come into a major's pipeline. And so that's where we get really excited about Delamar because we do think we're positioned to take advantage of the M&A. And, and quite frankly, one of the big reasons is because we have a very large resource, uh, 3.9 million ounces measured and indicated uh, there's not a lot of multi-million ounce resources in the Western United States uh, that's not already owned by a major. So uh, certainly it's a, it's a great project for us as we move forward. And then, of course, the people. Uh, you know, they, they often say that a lot of investment in, in, in this space is about backing the jockey. Uh, and so the team here at Integra, uh, we came from Integra Gold, which was, a, which was a, uh, quite a success where we took the project from a $20 million market cap in northern Quebec to a $600 million sale five years later to Eldorado Gold. So 
you know, what the probably to us, the, the most appealing thing or one of the most appealing things about Delamar is, is, is its profitability index to its jurisdiction. And so this chart here really lays that out for you. You know, where you want to be in this chart is kind of up in this area because it's saying that from a profitability perspective to a jurisdictional quality perspective, it's the most appealing. And what's really interesting is the size of the circle is related to your market cap. And so, you know, that smaller market cap, you'll see where, you know, in the, in the smaller range per se, it just generally means that we're undervalued uh, for where we are. And as we continue to de-risk the project, grow the resource, that valuation will continue to continue to increase. And, you know, where we are in this chart is not going to change, where the jurisdictional risk to profitability will remain the same. So the capital structure, the strong balance sheet, the one thing I had mentioned is, is one of the key components to investing in the space. Uh, as I mentioned, we just raised uh, $23 million US. It was our first cross-border financing. We just uplisted to the uh, New York Stock Exchange American at the end of July. So it was our first time financing cross-border. It was a fantastic experience. Uh, about 24 new institutions came in on the book. 19 of them were new. Um, with that financing, we have the $38 million US in the bank, which will see us through pre-feasibility in Q4 of 2021. Our market cap's about US $169 million, as you can see there on the left side. And then on the right side, we have a lot of strong support on the street uh, from, a, from an analyst perspective. So uh, obviously in the US, Raymond James, Stifle, and Roth, and then the balance being Canadian banks, um, Canadian banks uh, across the spectrum. So this is probably one of our favorite slides in the deck, which is why Idaho. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Idaho is ranked eighth in the world by the Fraser Institute uh, for investment for mining projects. Uh, it's got a very established workforce and a very supportive uh, government. Uh, the, the state uh, really likes to see these large infrastructure projects. Uh, it brings a lot of money and jobs. Uh, you know, in our PEA, we've outlined about 330 jobs going to a county with not a very large population. Uh, and the, the fellow you see there on the right is actually one of our board members, former three-term governor, former U.S. congressman, uh, Butch Otter. You know, when he retired uh, just last year from being governor, he was looking for board opportunities. He had a lot of options, uh, but he chose Integra for, for a few reasons. In fact, it's his only precious metals board seat. Uh, he's also on the board of First Cobalt, which is another Idaho company. Uh, but with Integra, he saw a project in a county that uh, certainly was looking for jobs, a project that because it was a past producer up until 2000, had a really uh, a, a clear permitting path uh, and, and something that you know, would be done within the timeline that he, he wants to work. And you know, being the former governor, a lot of our permitting, because our resource, resources are on patent ground will be done at the state level. He's been very helpful in opening doors uh, you know, when we go to Boise, it's easy to kind of meet with any of the agencies that will be involved in our permitting process. And in many cases, he's, he's either appointed the, the person or knows them quite well, uh, the, the heads of these various agencies. So he's been a fantastic add to our board uh, and, and all around uh, just a really good person. <clears throat> and why we like Delamar and that scarcity asset was one of the other the things that we'd pointed out on, you know, why we believe Delamar really stands out amongst the pack. And this is a, a, an interesting exercise we did with one of our banks. National banks did this with, for us. Uh, and essentially, we want to understand where does Delamar sit compared to, every, compared to the rest of, uh, rest of the projects out there. And so we looked at every project with, an, with a gold, silver resource on it. And that's how you get this number up here, 3,500. From there, we started removing things that we believe would be very uh, important for an M&A perspective, for an M&A transaction. So we removed things like, you know, not a valid economic study, less than 100,000 ounces per year, less than a 10-year mine life. And then the really two key ones for us were outside tier one jurisdictions, so outside uh, countries with very clear permitting paths, and projects that would cost less than uh, excuse me, in this case, we removed all the projects that cost more than $500 million to make because we believe that, you know, the major mining companies learned from the, the last bull market in the 2000s that you need to buy projects that are cheaper to build and very profitable. And so when we removed those, we were left with five assets. As of today, we're left with four assets because on Monday, this past Monday, November 2nd, Yamana bought uh, Monarch Gold's Wasamaic project uh, at, for a 40% premium. 
So really what's left on these large resource projects in tier one jurisdictions with, with a, a clear path to permitting are, are four projects and Delamar being one of those, one of those projects. Now, <clears throat> you know, you can have the greatest project in the world, but oftentimes you need a team to go with that project that actually can push that forward. And, you know, the team at Integra Resources came from Integra Gold. Integra Gold was the predecessor company to, to, in, to the Delamar project, to Integra Resources in Idaho. And that company started, Chris and I were both there in 2013. So not long after Steve Dijon, who's our chairman, took over the company in 2012. And we moved that project from really a, a small resource with no economics to a large resource with, a night, with, with an economic plan, a, an old mill that we bought out of bankruptcy. And we were very close to putting it in production ourselves. We actually had built the underground. We were about 120 meters, 300 feet roughly, vertical below ground. When Eldorado Gold, who owned 15% of us, took over the project. Uh, for $600 million. So it was a really uh, phenomenal success from a $20 million market cap when Chris and I started to a $600 million market cap or $600 million sale in 2017. And what's really interesting with that, that project is, you know, if you look at these numbers on the left, since 2012, there's been 52 asset acquisitions in the mining space. Of those 52, 16, only 16 are either in production or nearing production. Um, and our project, Eldorado took it from acquisition to commercial production in only 20 months. Um, and so that really demonstrates that it's not only about backing the jockey, but it's about backing the jockey that can set the table for production. And quite frankly, if, if you look at some of the reporting from Eldorado and Lamac, they, they've been incredibly happy with the asset. They've just made a new discovery. They continue to increase guidance. It continues to really be a cash cow for them. So what is Delamar? Delamar is an emerging gold story in the Western US. And, and you know, we're in Idaho, it's a tier one asset, and there's a lot to really like as we move this forward. So a quick history of the project, because it's quite a unique history. There's actually really two eras of mining that occurred at Delamar. Uh, the first occurred from really the late 1800s until World War I, and that was a high grade underground uh, mining operation. They produced about 250,000 ounces up until World War I, averaging about one ounce per ton mining, half ounce per ton cutoff. Uh, they would drive addits into the underground and just get on these veins that ran north-south and, and run for as long as they could. At the start of World War I, mining kind of wrapped up in the area. There was intermittent spurts of mining in the 30s and 40s, but really it wasn't until the 19. 60s that people started to poke around the area again and it was the Delamar mine that operated from the late 1970s to late 1990s which was the modern day operation that occurred here at Delamar. The last operator on the project was Kinross Gold uh, and they actually operated it until 1998 when uh, US $300 gold it was no longer profitable. It wasn't that they ran out of gold in fact they left a very large remnant gold and silver uh, uh, deposit behind which is why we have a 3.9 million ounce MNI resource. Uh, they just really shut it down because the $300 gold, it wasn't the margins they needed. And so they shut it down, put it into reclamation where it sat for 20 years until Integra Resources acquired it uh, right after our uh, project in Quebec was, was bought by Eldorado. And we believe, you know, and our PEA demonstrates that this again could, has the potential to be another large mine and bring a lot of economic opportunity and jobs to, to both Owyhee County in Idaho and Malheur County in Oregon. So where have we come from and where are we now? So this is one of my favorite slides because it really demonstrates how much work we've done over a relatively short period, so three years. When we acquired the project, it didn't have a resource on it. It, it was, uh, the resource had lapsed from the Kinross days. We put together uh, using historic drilling and then our own drilling, a 3.9 million ounce m and resource and a half a million ounce uh, inferred resource. The m and resource is, is, is key because it's a higher confident gold silver category. It means that we don't need to do infill drilling. We don't need to go do con confirmatory drilling. We know that resource is there. We can put that resource into a pre-feasibility study without doing any additional drill work, which is fantastic. The other real thing that's changed is historically this was run through a mill. Uh, that mill was uh, sold off during the reclamation process. Uh, we uh, 
did some heavy geological work to demonstrate that, in fact, the a large chunk of this resource was amenable to heat bleaching. Uh, and heat bleaching is really just uh, affordable, cheap mining. It's moving rock to let heat bleach pads and then pulling gold and silver off. And in this part of the world, particularly in Nevada, very common, uh, it's a very common mining method. So with those two things known, we put out our first economic study, a preliminary economic assessment in 2019, very much a snapshot in time. So we ran those numbers at 1350 gold, 1690 silver. So uh, about $600 less than spot gold price today. Uh, and at that conservative gold price, we had a very, very good economics, uh, US 358 MPV at a 5% discount, 43% IRR. And for $161 million pre-production CapEx, it gets us to a strong 124,000 ounces per year over a 10-year mine life. Obviously, a lot of leverage to rising gold prices uh, at, at you know, $1,800 gold, $1,900 gold. That NPV gets closer to $800 million and an 80% IRR. Since acquiring the, the two deposits from Kinross, which I'll show you in a moment, we've also added a lot of land. Uh, so we've added uh, greenfield option that we believe is very right for discovery. We've also added War Eagle, which was, which was drilled in the late 1980s, and we drilled in the late 2019, highest grade drilling to date. So we've really quadrupled the layout package from what we acquired initially from, from Kinross. Um, from an from a, uh, institutional registry holder, uh, we have 38 million, as I mentioned, in the bank, and we're about 55% institutionally held, to some of the large institutions being Franklin, ASA, Royal Bank of Canada, uh, a slew of, of European funds. Uh, and then Core Mining is another one of our key shareholders. Uh, they're the mid-tier producer based out of Chicago. They have operations in Nevada, Mexico, and Alaska. Uh, they own 6% of the company uh, with retail high net worth and management kind of making up the balance. Quickly on the PEA, and then I'll take you to a bit more of an interactive uh, portion of the, of the presentation, just show you the, the, the mine itself, the, the, the deposit itself. So this is the PEA, as I mentioned, uh, this was a snapshot, and this is really is a snapshot in time from from late last year. And you know, we're very cognizant that you should always show a path forward as the operator. So this is the the PEA that we could build. So for you know, 161 million dollars pre-production capex, uh, it gets you to 124,000 ounces per year, about 150 from years two to six. Uh, at an all-in sustaining cost is US 742 dollars an ounce. What's really interesting with this, and will change as we move towards the pre-fees, is that we only included about 2 million ounces of the total resource on the project in the economics. Part of that is that there's a large sulfide component at one of the two deposits that we didn't bring into the PEA because we wanted to do more metallurgical work on it. You know, that metallurgical work is underway. We now know that a, a, a chunk of that we will be able to bring into the pre-fees uh, as we get towards that stage next, next year. So to now transport you to the project and give you a bit of an idea of what it looks like and where we're at. Um, <clears throat> this is the uh, Google image. Uh, the state of, this is the, the southwest corner of Idaho. Uh, Boise is up here in uh, the upper right corner of, of the project there, or upper right corner of the image there. We drive an hour and a half by uh, highway to a small town called Jordan Valley, and then in by secondary road to the two deposits. So Delamar here has a 3.3 million ounce resource and Florida Mountain there has a 1.1 million ounce resource. Historically, they were mined in tandem with material from Florida Mountain being trucked down to Delamar for processing. That land that we've added since the acquisition is what you see up here in the Northwest. Uh, that is black sheep. That's a greenfield option. Really exciting. We brought in some very famous geologists for this type of deposit. It's called the epithermal, epithermal system. They were the ones that encouraged us to act, uh, to bring this land into our package. They said, it's got everything you want to see from an epithermal system. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that we can make a discovery in there. We're going to be drilling about 3,000 meters in there starting in, in uh, late November and, and through the winter. The other interesting uh, uh, package that we added was this War Eagle land package. Uh, we acquired that from Ely Gold, had some really interesting drilling from the late 1980s. We came in in, in late last year. Drilled it, got some very high grade, in fact, the highest grade hits we've had to date on the project. Doesn't have a resource on it yet, uh, but we believe we can get to, the, to one there. And, you know, generally all of these deposits uh, are connected by road. It could be brought back to the general Delamar Florida Mountain Processing Facility. 
Hey, Josh, how far is that from 80? From I-80? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. I'll have to look it up. Um, but is it, is it a long haul, you know, off the high, main highway? No, there? no. It's only about three hours to Winnemucca. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah. and it's one of the big, a lot of trucks use that route to, yeah. to, to, get, to get west. Okay. Okay. It's a good one. I've never been asked that question before. I've driven there a lot, a hundred okay. times, oh, but wow. I can tell you the highway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, quickly moving from that overview to Florida Mountain. Uh, Florida Mountain is, is interesting because this is where we start mining in the PEA. Uh, you can see the remnant pits where they were mining up until 1998. Uh, and the, the resource here at Florida Mountain really lies from the top of those pit walls to just underneath that haul road you see there. And so this is a 1.1 million ounce resource uh, at, at Florida Mountain. And some interesting things happen. And we're actually drilling here currently uh, and for, for two reasons. As you may recall, I mentioned that there was a high grade history that, uh, at this project up until World War I. And if you look down the hillside here, you can see these what look like piles of sand. These are actually historic mine dumps. So everywhere you see one of those, there's actually a tunnel into the mountain. And the old timers would tunnel in, get on these veins uh, that were ran about an ounce per ton material, and they produced 250,000 ounces from under Florida Mountain. And some interesting things happened last year as we were drilling on the top that became very clear it correlated to what's below. And so we were putting in these, these uh, north-south, sort of the east-west running met drill fences, those yellow lines I've been putting in, and we started getting these really high-grade hits of gold and silver. It became clear to us that we were getting high-grade hits, uh, what we call shoots. It's a geological term. It's just a concentration of gold and silver. But it was clear that they were correlated to the vein system that run under, runs underneath Florida Mountain. And we know that these veins, um, you know, there's seven veins that run under here. And what we started doing is we started modeling those shoots as they go down into the veins. And so for the first part of the summer, we just placed two drill rigs uh, really at the bottom of the pit here that drove into these high grade shoots and into these veins to understand is there a high grade potential deposit below this low grade deposit on top of Florida Mountain? And so we started drilling that. The drill rig's actually just finished. But to just show you quickly what that looks like. So the image you see on the screen there is actually the resource. So the red, green, and blue, that's 1.1 million ounce resource at Florida Mountain. And those red lines are actually the seven veins that are under Florida Mountain. We were able to model those based on historic record as well as our own drilling. And you can actually see, as I spin this, those blacked out areas are actually where they mined the 250,000 ounces out of this, uh, this system back up until World War I. And so we uh, essentially placed the drill rig at the bottom of that pit and just started driving into these vein systems to start understanding how they hang together, what's, what's under there, uh, what do the grades look like. And so for the first time, this was, uh, this was the first time this was ever drilled in modern times. And the drill results you see on the screen there are what we drilled. And so we got some very high grades of both gold and silver over really nice widths. And what's interesting about this drilling is really those long runs of, of yellow, that's in the existing resource. So that's just additional confirmatory drilling. But everything you see below that blue line I drew there is outside the resource and has the potential to uh, to go into a, what, what a high-grade deposit as we continue to drill this. We've released two rounds of drill results uh, from this high-grade underground. Uh, of the total 16,000 meter exploration program um, that we're doing this year on the project, uh, we still have more than three quarters of drill results still to be, to be, to be released. Uh, a big reason for that, as you may have heard if you're following the sector, is that the assay labs are very backed up because so many companies are drilling right now and so many companies are financed to drill. So as we get those uh, results back, we're going to release them and, and put them out into the, into the market. And really, they will be the primary news flow for us really going into 2021. The second really interesting target for us uh, at, the, at the mine site is uh, around Florida Mountain. So, uh, you know, the, we have this high grade focus as part of our exploration program, but there's also low grade expansion. And this kind of dark purple that you see here is, um, is, is called soil geochemistry. It's golden soils. And that dark purple is actually our cutoff. So that's what we use. Everything above that dark purple would go onto the heap leach pads. 
And if I draw in the 1.1 million ounce resource here at Florida Mountain, you can see that there. That's the 1.1 million ounces that currently exists at Florida Mountain. You can see it sits in that dark purple anomaly. And then all around it, there's other anomalies that haven't been tested. So those two drill rigs that were tested underground have moved uh, up here to the north and the south, and then they're gonna move to this big anomaly to the east that we call the Florida Keys. There are six drill holes in there. Uh, historically, just on the edge, it all graded gold and silver, but no one stepped further east. So that's where our drills are gonna be turning next, uh, and that's where the next set of drill results will be coming. But we believe that we can add significant resource here at Florida that would all be keep reachable, go into the mine plan, uh, and, and hopefully we'll capture it into that pre -fees. So a lot of exciting drill results to come uh, from Florida as we move forward. Uh, here's a, uh, oh, sorry. Just to bring you back to, uh, you know, the, the, the two deposits and where we're drilling. So, it, you know, we've got uh, 7,000 meters of drilling up here at Florida Mountain. And then we're off to Black Sheep and War Eagle where there's 5,000 meters of drilling underway. Those results will start coming out soon as well. And then of course, uh, the Black Sheep target. <clears throat> and here's some of the, the highlights from drilling that we've completed to date. Uh, so lots of high grade at all the different deposits uh, and more of this to come through 2021. Uh, and really the plan for next year is update the resource estimate in half one of 2021, followed by a pre-feasibility study in Q4 of 2024. And then on the back of that pre-feasibility study, we would, we would hope to file our plan of operations, which pushes us into, into formal permitting in the United States. Uh, and then from there, it would be about a one-year completeness review, so 2022, an environmental impact study in 2023. And then we would expect hope that in 2024, we'd have that construction decision, the record of decision from the state to move, to move this forward. So here's sort of that, that catalyst uh, that, I, that I just laid out. So, you know, lots of drill results coming over the next, uh, the next six months, uh, you know, in, in, in the resource sector, that's a huge, uh, that, that creates a lot of value, that creates a lot of excitement, that, you know, is what uh, provides the muse for, for, the, for the company then that resource update, and then the pre-feasibility and plan of operations. So cognizant of time, we're 30 minutes in. Um, you know, that's really the, the plan in a nutshell. Look for a lot of uh, news results uh, as we go into next year. You know, we're fully financed through 2021, so uh, it's certainly a good position to be in as, as we uh, end the year here and enter a new one. Any questions? Good stuff. Great. Yeah, great presentation, Josh. Um, quick quest question from the audience. Uh, on your bot deal in September, mm -hmm. uh, and that was for uh, 23 million, am I correct in reading that? Yeah, correct, US 23 million. Okay, can you kind of more specifically run through some of the you know, CapEx and capital allocation um, for this? And in terms of the breakdown on that allocation, as it pertains to each of the projects, um, you know, going from Delamar to Florida to War Eagle and, and what have you. So it'll be a very similar budget to what we did this year. So we'll have a similar size drill program. Uh, and then really the balance of that goes to, to development, to development costs. Uh, we actually are in the process of budgets right now, so I don't have exact numbers, but, you know, to give you an idea of this past year, we spent about $10 million, or we're spending about $10 million on exploration, we're spending about $10 million on development work, and that development work is, you know, uh, and these things are underway now because you got to start this stuff early as you get towards that permitting phase, so we're doing baseline studies on water and air, and then we'll get into, you know, uh, counting creatures and things like that. Uh, at the same time, advanced engineering, uh, a lot of metallurgy. So, you know, one of the things for heap leach is you want to understand variability. So is, is it consistent across the deposit? So we've been doing a lot of variability test work uh, and all of that will just get wrapped into the pre -fees. So, you know, I would expect the budget to be relatively similar next year, but like I said, we're, we're kind of in budget season right now where we're putting all of that stuff forward. Got it, got it. And with regards to <clears throat> the 
the acquisition of Delamar from Kinross. Uh, you know, what was the cost there for you guys and who spearheaded that? Was that uh, through George or was that through Stephen or how did that, give me kind of the, the timeline on, on what once you, you know, liquidated uh, Integra Gold, what was the kind of a process or timeline going into Integra Resources? Yeah, so it's funny. I mean, I think we all, uh, we sold Integra Gold in the middle of the summer, and I think everyone was sort of thinking we'd be able to take a bit of time off. I, I certainly was dreaming of, of mountain bikes and hikes, uh, and it was about four weeks after the acquisition that, you know, we had been approached by our now VPX, a fellow named Max Baker, uh, who was a PhD in epithermal systems, which is what Delamar is. And he had been hired by Kinross to put the sales document together. So Kinross wanted to sell Delamar. They'd hired him to kind of prepare a document that they, they could then share with people that would be interested. And he was close friends with George. He and George had worked together in the past and he knew what was happening with, with Lamac. And so he had approached George and said, I think you guys should take a look at this. It's really exciting. It's got a lot of the similar check marks that you had at Lamac. So past producer, Brownfields, um, you know, a lot of upside. And so uh, George started working on it um, not long after we sold Lamac, and it became apparent that this was, you know, an opportunity. Though we all were looking forward to some time off, this was an opportunity that we could really pass on. Uh, and so we got we threw our hat in the ring. There's about four other groups that were also bidding on it, uh, and we were fortunate enough to 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 win the acquisition. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, another question from the audience from Tom. Um, his question is, did I hear correctly drilling to start at Black Sheep this month? Uh, also, what are the drilling priorities in 2021? Uh, so, yeah, so I'll give you a bit of the sequence this year. So we started at Florida Mountain with two rigs. And then we have a third drill rig over at War Eagle currently that's wrapping up a 5,000 meter program. Once the two drill rigs at Florida Mountain are complete, we'll send one to an area that we call Deadwood Ridge, which is sort of in between Delamar and Black Sheep, but it's kind of part of the Black Sheep complex, if you will. And then the other rig, the other rig at Florida Mountain will go to Black Sheep. Uh, and the beauty of Black Sheep is, uh, you know, we're in a high mountainous region. So Florida Mountain's about 7,500 feet above sea level, Delamar's around 6,000, and Black Sheep's below that. And so from a snow perspective, it gets a lot less snow. Uh, and it's an area that, that we believe we can, we can drill through the winter as long as we don't have a massive snow, snow uh, we don't have too much snow this year. So yeah, the goal would be to start drilling black sheep by the end of this month, early December. Most likely we'll turn the drills off for a month, kind of mid-December to mid-January, but then start them back up in, in January. Right. And then next year, uh, you know, some, next year will be partially driven by, you know, results as they came in this year, but Florida Mountain will still be a priority. Uh, we, we made a large discovery of an IP anomaly uh, in Rich Gulch, which is actually on the other, the other side of the valley from Florida Mountain. So that certainly is a priority. The highest chargeability in the project is there right now, uh, as well as kind of additional drilling, I would think, around Florida Keys and the north-south uh, extensions of, of the existing resource there. Got it. Got it. Are there any other names in the district or the area? No, we're sort of by ourselves down in the southwest corner. Uh, there is uh, B Metals actually it operates out of Jordan Valley too. They're they're looking at base metals uh, up at uh, I believe it's Thunder Mountain. So they're they're quite close. But in terms of operators, uh, there's a lot of operations in the eastern part. The phosphate district is very active. They just permitted a three mile open pit phosphate uh, plan there. And then in the north, in that Silver Valley, you have Hecla that operates up there. America's Gold and Silver. Um, and, and then uh, the cobalt folks are sort of in yeah. the yeah. Central East. Yeah. So another question, um, going back to your reply on the previous question, it sounds like some of the project is accessible all year long and some of it is better pre post winter. And so we're obviously looking at Delamar as being one of those that is probably not 12 months. Is that correct? Based on the, the elevation and the snow there or? So historically it was always, it was operated year round. It's just, it, just for us, we could drill Florida mountain in the winter. Uh, <laughs> it's just a cost pr perspective, you know, cause you, it's, it's depending on the amount of snow, it could be a big, a big bill to keep the snow, the road yeah. open. 
Yep. So we have to keep Delamar open year round because we do have a, a water treatment facility that's uh, active. And so the Delamar site is, is accessible year round uh, because of that. And so we focus typically on the lower elevation drilling in the, in the fall and winter. And then summer goes to War Eagle and Florida Mountain. Uh, and just because it's more cost effective to do it that way. Got it. Got it. So in looking at the track record with Integra Gold uh, and kind of how you guys are mapping this out so far, when you look at it overall, and I'm sure this is a little bit premature at this point, but, but who knows, um, in terms of the, the end game, so are you guys looking at an acquisition at some point and who would be a viable candidate for that at this point, or is it just way too premature at this point? Uh, you know, I, we're going to stick to the similar blueprint to what yeah. we had up at Lamac. You know, uh, obviously we have core mining in um, already uh, as a 6% shareholder, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, the, the, what I think made us really successful in the previous project is that we always move forward uh, as if we were going to be the operators. Um, Sorry, my dog just started barking. Yeah, very, work. very embarrassing. Dog. Come on. <laughs> Fortunately, I keep a bone here just in case that happens. <laughs> but um, yeah, so th that's the blueprint that, that we, you know, for at Lamac, most people don't know is that we were actually days away from signing project finance. And it was that that really, I think, tr helped trigger Eldorado's move. Um, and so we're going to kind of stick to that. We'll de-risk it. We'll move it forward, always being ready to be the operator. And, you know, if down the road, someone wants to come in. Obviously, you know, we've, we've always had an open door policy. We, you know, sign a CA, hop in our data room. Yep. Um, nothing to hide. There you go. Uh, another question from the audience um, from Ron. Do you run the risk of labor union problems like Hecla has? Oh, up at the Lucky Friday. Yeah. You know, that's a question I don't know if I have a really good answer for because um, I, I don't, I'm not sure historically if there was a union on, on site. Um, but, uh, you know, this will be a, a mine that's competing with the likes of, of the Nevada group. So it'll be very good paid jobs uh, in a part of the world that's pretty affordable to live. Um, so, it, you know, probably premature to, to at, at this point, uh, but uh, I, I don't foresee it per se. At least right now, it's affordable. Um, as, <laughs> yeah, but uh, the foreign, Californians are moving into Boise quick. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. I know that directly. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, Josh, I came in late, but I see Q4 will be your plan of ops. What's your target date quarter for startup production? Uh, <laughs> another difficult question to answer at this stage, but I can tell you what we, we believe our our timeline is and one thing that is is really interesting and, and people may have seen it is that we recently signed a memorandum of understanding an mou with the bureau of land management so our resources are on patented ground so we deal mostly with the state on a permitting pr level but our infrastructure we've placed all on blm grounds and so that mou just means that we're actually financing uh, a position in the local office and then the blm assigns someone to that position who works on our project. So we believe that means we'll have a very efficient timeline for permitting. But at this stage, you know, we've kind of estimated that 48 to 60 months would be when you have that plan of, or that record of decision, uh, which would allow you to start construction. Uh, so 24, 25 would be in our minds when you'd kind of have, uh, have construction underway. Got it, got it. So uh, with the other projects, with Florida and War Eagle, were, were those Kinross as well? So Florida Mountain and Delamar were mined by Kinross in tandem. Okay. Uh, Florida Mountain came on, it, they started at Delamar in the 70s, and then Florida Mountain came up uh, in, the, in the 90s. Uh, War Eagle was not part of it, uh, and not, neither was Black Sheep. Okay, okay. So in terms of the acquisition on Florida Mountain, Vis a vis Delmar, did you guys get you know a pretty pretty nice deal like you did on Delmar? Yeah, so Delmar and Florida Mountain were packaged together by oh, they were. Okay. Yeah, okay. but but it but, but it's funny you say that because Florida Mountain actually the claims had lapsed, so we, we bought that from a from a family that Ken Ross introduced us to. So Got it. Uh, and we did get good terms on that. Got it. Great. Um, 
Okay. Um, if there's nothing else from the audience at this point, uh, I want to thank everyone for participating today in uh, hearing the Integra Resources story from Josh. This is a great team and a great story, and uh, really, really glad to have them present to what we know is a, a really great constituency. Um, so again, thank you to everyone for taking the time. Uh, if there's any questions moving forward, you can certainly contact 49 North directly. Uh, we will be uh, soliciting feedback for Josh and Chris moving forward on the presentation today. And again, to the great Josh Surface, thank you again for your time. Um, exceptional job. What kind of skis are those, by the way, back there? You know, I don't know what brand they are, but they're 10th Mountain Division, which is uh, in Colorado is where they train. Oh. So it's, it's just, uh, they, look like, they look like Dina Star to me. I'm going to throw that out there. They could be. Uh, I mean, they weigh about 30 pounds. They're they solid. Really? Yeah, they're so heavy. But they're, they're pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing they were skiing all over on them. Yeah, pretty sweet. Very sweet. Thank um, you for noticing them. I love them. Yeah, great. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Josh, for uh, your time today. Great story. And uh, again, if there's more questions, uh, you can hit us at 49 North uh, at, to myself personally and or Chris Gordon uh, and or uh, Josh directly. And uh, we will uh, be uh, you know, throwing out the feedback to you guys. We'd love to get that uh, over to Josh and Chris as well. It's, it's mission critical in terms of this exercise. And uh, thanks to everyone for participating today and uh, have a great weekend and 